What's going on, everybody? My name is Ryan Snelling. Welcome to Watch Diary. I'm so excited to be here today. We have an action-packed episode. It's going to be a little all over the place. It's not as focused as it normally is. There's a lot to talk about um, in the world of movies. and I like the variety, though. You know, So here's what we're going to do today. I released a rewatch episode covering the 20th anniversary of The Born Identity earlier this week on the YouTube channel exclusively. I did not put it up as a podcast, so if you haven't already, please go enjoy. I just spent 30 minutes gushing about one of my all-time favorite movies. Because of that, to celebrate, we're going to do an every movie ever ranking all of The Born movies, a topic that I'm very passionate about. We're going to review Lightyear. I did put an early reaction video out right now, so you can get my right out of the theater thoughts on the YouTube channel as well. And then I'm going to rank Toy Story movies. And then we have to record, record, review the latest review for Joseph Kaczynski's Spiderhead, which I just watched earlier today. So I'm really excited about that. And then we will update every movie ever for Joseph Kaczynski. So I'm excited. A lot of stuff to do here. Um, I, I'm, I'm thrilled. I just got done recording. I don't have all of my trusty Trent to cold brew here. Um, because I actually recorded an episode with Brando right before I got on here. Ah. Sorry. Just celebrating. Celebrating the 20th anniversary of Minority Report. So that episode drops on the 21st, so after this one. So that is coming on the YouTube channel and the podcast feed as well. But yeah, that's why I don't have my trusty Trent to cold brew, but I do have a trusty Trent to water, and it doesn't work as well. Trusty Trent to water, it doesn't sound as good as trusty Trent to cold brew, uh, but that's okay. It's important to stay hydrated, especially when it's 110 degrees. Oh my God. So normally when I record the out of the theater reactions, I just do it in my car, I saw a light year midday, so when I got out, it was like 4.30. It was still like 110 degrees, and I thought, surely to God, I can record this video. It's only going to last four or five minutes. I can record in my car. Why am I lagging? That's It drives me crazy with this sometimes, because I am lagging, and I don't know why, and I don't know how to fix it. And the webcam... I just don't get it. Sorry. I just got distracted, but like I just plugged in my webcam and it acts like I'm lagging for some reason. Anyway, so I'm, I'm in my car and I think, oh, I can surely to God record this video for four to five minutes. No big deal. And I'll go home. I had, a I had to do a couple different takes and that's that was the problem. But I, I happen to just look at my camera and I notice I am drenched in sweat. I'm recording this video, my out of the theater reaction for Lightyear, and sweat is just pouring down my head. And I didn't realize how hot I was getting just because I was trying to focus on the video. And uh, so I, I, I had to book it home. But that's the thing. I couldn't turn on my AC because then you'd hear AC in my car. So I was like, oh, I'll just cool down. I'll drive home with the AC on and then I'll film it in my apartment complex parking lot. I did that. Same problem, had a couple of different takes. And again, I'm only in the car for a maximum of like 10 minutes, but I'm just drenched. So I had to come inside and film it in the apartment. It, it is just like so hot and I don't like to talk about the weather, but it was like the one time that the weather affected me because, you know, who cares? What, why does the weather affect anybody? Uh, unless it's a natural disaster, of course. I'm not making light of that. But um, yeah, I don't talk about the weather. But this time it actually affected me. So I had to come in here and, you know, just cool down in my... It's crazy. So thank God for air conditioning. Um, I don't spend a lot of time being grateful for things like that. But it reminded me that air conditioning is... What a blessing that is. And it's so glad that it's working for me right now. So it's so hot. Um, but it's all good. I hope everybody's doing well. I had a seven was it seven days or eight day stretch at work back to back to back and they were all closing uh shifts and i i didn't give myself time i think i talked about this on the last podcast but i didn't give myself time to rest when i got home from kentucky i went straight back to work and it was a seven day eight day stretch whatever it was 
Yesterday was my first day off, and it was so nice to not do anything but sit. I did, like I said, I did go see Lightyear, and it was an early screening, so it was middle of the day. I could still come home, and I'm trying to get back to the gym. I, I took, what, three weeks off, something like that? It was close to three weeks off from the gym, maybe two weeks. Um, but getting back into that, it's been a pain. I'm not going to lie. I That habit, you don't think about it, but habits drop fast. Um, it took a long time for, and it, I mean, that was like literally a daily thing for me. Every single day I went to the gym for like five months straight. I took two weeks off and now it's like the hardest thing to go back and a little like discouraging. I know it shouldn't be, but I'm just kind of talking this out. It was discouraging at first because I, I couldn't just like go right back into what I've been doing. You know, I've been doing a lot of light stuff, um, not nearly as much as I normally do. Just a few like compound lifts and things like that. And a lot lighter than I, I mean. I totally just like was out of shape, I guess. Not totally out of shape, but you know what I mean. Because I knew if I went hard the way that I had been doing up until that point, I would just get sore. And um, I wasn't going to be able to lift what I was normally doing anyway. So I was just like, oh, I'll just take a light and I'll ease back into it. And So yeah, so I'm, I'm going through it right now. I've only been a couple times, but uh, the, it, that's a habit that I'm gladly gladly getting back into just because i don't want to go through this again where I, it just becomes a habit i was drinking you know i drank a lot when i was in kentucky when i got home i, I bought more beer and so yeah i'm i'm getting back to not drinking and and going to the gym so that's been nice and uh but it was nice to come back to work on this too you know i did podcast last week on jurassic world and uh but yeah but this one's this was a nice um this episode is going to have a nice variety of things to discuss, so I'm really, really excited. Um, that's really all that I had to say at the top here. We, we've got a lot to do and discuss, so we might as well just go on into it. Um, like I said, I did a video celebrating the 20th anniversary of The Born Identity, one of my all-time favorite movies, so definitely go and check that out. But because of that, I'm down to do an every movie ever ranking every single born movie this franchise means a whole hell of a lot to me uh i said it in the video but the born identity when i saw it it was like right after it came out and it just influenced so much of my taste you know it was uh at a point where i was absorbing cinema like a sponge and everything was new to me and the born identity it was something that i didn't know that i needed but i i did and i love it and it's one of my all-time favorite franchises hands down one of the most pivotal franchises of i don't know my cinema fandom so i love talking about born um there's all kinds of podcasts in my in my past where i talk about this franchise but yeah let's rank for no reason whatsoever, other than the 20th anniversary of The Born Identity, let's rank all the Born movies, shall we? I think I have it posted up on my letterbox, but if you guys are into letterbox and you want to stay up to date on all of my rankings and everything that I do, uh, I put them all up on my account. Just go to letterbox.com slash rewatch Ryan. There's only, of course, five movies in The Born uh, franchise, so I don't feel the need to give you any sort of graphics. I'm just going to walk through all of them. I feel like number five is it's the most obvious one. I think we all agree. Maybe we don't all agree. Um, but I, I think Jason Bourne is easily the worst movie in the franchise. I think also there was a time, though, that Jason Bourne was maybe... It could go down as maybe one of my most anticipated movies of all time. Um, because I loved, loved the Born original Born trilogy, right? And then when they give us like Born Legacy, and you're either in or you're out on that movie, but they give you that, and they sort of tease that they're not done with it, and they also just tease this possibility of like an epic crossover uh, between uh, Jeremy Renner and Matt Damon's characters for this franchise. It's like. It was just awesome. And this was like peak Renner fandom too. And the fact that like, oh, Matt Damon would, oh, I'd come back if Paul Greengrass would come back. And it's not like Paul Greengrass is like the most in demand director. It felt like at any point for years, we could get um, that Jason Bourne. And I can't remember <laughs> Jeremy Renner's characters. Um, Aaron Cross. I was going to say Alex Cross, but obviously that's wrong. Um, for years, I... Um, 
just dreamed for another Jason Bourne movie with the, that crossover and what that could be like. And maybe that was impossible, but we finally got it. When they announced Jason Bourne and the the materials coming out, you know, there's a shot with him in the desert where he's, uh, I guess, a part of that like fight club or whatever. Like all that stuff was happening. Alicia Vikander, Riz Ahmed, just, oh my God, sign me up. Unfortunately, it's the least inspired Jason Bourne movie of all time. Um, it finally, for me, felt like they had done everything that they could possibly do with this franchise. And I know the show Treadstone has since come out. I have not watched it. I don't really care to. And unfortunately, Jason Bourne killed the franchise um, instead of it ended the franchise. Um, and, and that's sad because there's a lot of things that I do love in it and about it. But it's also the least. I think I've only seen it like one and a half times. I just don't ever want to want to rewatch it um and unfortunately they they probably should have just left it where it was but um yeah lesson learned um it's the fifth worst number four is the ugly stepchild maybe it's not an ugly stepchild it's just the stepchild of the franchise and that is the born legacy but let me tell you it's number four because it's competing with matt damon's born trilogy you know that's that's really it other than that i think the born legacy is actually pretty damn awesome uh it was directed by tony gilroy who i do respect a lot and i i tell you what the the structure of this movie is like so weird because it follows aaron cross it's almost like a silent film for him and like the first 30 minutes and you don't really know much about him, and all of a sudden, like he's thrown into the story. You know, most of the time at the beginning, anyway, it's uh, all the the pharmaceutical stuff and the Edward Norton stuff, and we're kind of just following this guy along as he's trekking through the snow. Um, it's a weird structure, but then it quickly does turn into this Born esque movie. I love the idea of um, creating weapons with the chems and all that kind of stuff, and I love his relationship with Rachel Weiss and. I just think that this is a it's a weird movie that I embrace and accept quite a bit. And I do really appreciate it. And uh, I don't know. There's just something about this movie that um, it didn't feel like it was trying to be a ripoff. And I understand if you think that. Like, I, I totally get why people think it's a ripoff and just obviously, like, trying to capture something that they can't recapture. But, like... I actually just think this is a fun contributor to the franchise and um, I appreciate it. I do wish that there was some sort of crossover, but I'm not really sure. I don't know if that, that makes sense. And maybe that's part of the problem is that this doesn't even feel like a Bourne movie. If you can't see these two characters together, uh, they do have the nod to Jason Bourne though, when he's staying in the cabin and he finds his name etched in the wood. Um, I just wonder what that would be like if there was a way where these two came together um, but like I said, it's better now in retrospect that we don't get that at all. But the Born Legacy at the time, again, highly anticipated film for me because I just loved what they did in the in the Born trilogy. And so, but yeah, I think this is uh, this is a nice little neat little film that I actually embrace, and uh, I actually don't think it destroyed the franchise in the way that Jason Bourne did. So with that said, that is my number four. Um, so now let's go to the top three. Born movies, you know, uh, these are a masterclass in action filmmaking and uh, three of Matt Damon's best movies. Number three is the end of the trilogy. It is the Born Ultimatum. I just simply find myself re-watching this um, uh, less than the other two previous movies. And I, some of the action scenes, fantastic. The rooftop chase scene, look, the Born franchise, it goes without saying highly influential across all like every other action franchise that has ever come out. You know, a lot of these rooftop scenes, you know, I just rewatched the mission Impossible fallout as Tom Cruise is racing across European rooftops. Of course I can only think of born and uh, they're wildly different franchises, but born is a highly influential franchise. You know, it goes without saying it changed James Bond forever. And so of course we have Edgar Ramirez. We have Albert Finney, we have the end, Scott Glenn. We have the end of the franchise. We find out about his past. We find out his true identity. And um, it's just a, a nice epic conclusion. I think for a long time, 
I sort of thought as this trilogy is it gets better with every movie. And that doesn't happen often. I mean, can you think of a single movie trilogy that gets better with every single installment? It never really works out that way. Like, the first one might be good, and the third one might be better, but the second one's either, either like, middling, or maybe the second one's the best one. Like, it doesn't happen where every movie is better than the last one. And for a long time, I thought that that was the case. But I realized I'm just more attached to the previous two entries in the Bourne Ultimatum, even though it's a wonderful conclusion. I do think it has less to offer than the other two movies. So that's why The Bourne Ultimatum is number three on my list. Now, this is where the list gets good. If you didn't think it was good now, it gets good now. <laughs> number two is the movie that started it all. The Bourne Identity. Um, I've said everything that I had to say about the Born Identity in my rewatch, but um, for those of you who don't want to watch it, <laughs> um, I wasn't allowed to watch uh, PG-13 movies, really, until I was of age. There were, of course, exceptions, but when I turned 13 and I was able to like get DVDs as gifts or I was able to sort of go to Blockbuster and have mostly free reign as to what I wanted to watch... Or watch more things on TV where my mom would be a little bit more relaxed. Um, the Born Identity was one of the first movies that I chose for myself to watch. As a fan of like, oh, I'm, these are this, I'm going to start discovering movies for myself. And The Born Identity was one of the first ones. And I watched it at home by myself. My mom was out on a date. So she probably picked me up some chilies or something. And I stayed at home and watched this movie. And I fell in love with it. And I got the DVD, and it it's what started my love for the entire franchise. Possibly my love for Matt Damon. I think Matt Damon is uh, my most watched actor. Uh, if you look it up on Letterboxd, I'm a huge Matt Damon fan. And, you know, I just... It's been so pivotal in my life. And I, I have so many, like, friends that also got in on Bourne as well. Like, uh, my film teacher in high school was a huge Bourne fan. And so we love these movies, and, you know, we've reviewed them, and... Um, I've just had such a great relationship with this franchise and this is where it started. And, you know, it wasn't until recently, uh, that I got to see this for the very first time in theaters because it played, uh, during the P word, uh, or, you know, during the C word, if you will, or the past couple of years when movies were in movie theaters, they did release the born identity for some reason. Um, and I got to see it and I got to show my friend. And so that was a lot of fun to kind of share that with him all these years later. And yeah, I, I can say that I finally seen all of them in theaters. That's another thing too. I remember seeing every one of these movies in theaters, but the born identity was the one I hadn't up until about a year ago. So anyway, um, the born identity, just a highly influential film on me and Hollywood and Matt Damon, just such a great job of being vulnerable while also kicking ass. And it all starts here. Um, so the born identity is my number two film that leaves one. Um, the born supremacy, I think is one of the greatest action sequels ever made. And I think in a lot of smart ways, it departs itself from the born identity. I think the part that, you know, people might differ on, I haven't really had a whole lot of conversation with the people outside of, uh, my circle, but you know, the decision to, um, kill Marie off early in the film uh, sort of sets a trajectory as to where this franchise is going. But I think it's actually a responsible decision because I don't think it's actually believable that anyone, anyone can really be close to Jason Bourne when he is who he is. And so even though we fell in love with him in the first movie, I think it's a, a valuable lesson that we learn as an audience and also that he learns. And this is also about reckoning. Um, he's still having his nightmares, he's still having his flashbacks, and he has to reconcile for things that he's done. And this movie is equally about his past, while also, you know, he's got to find peace and reconciliation as a person, and he also just kicks so much ass. Um, unfortunately, the thing that hasn't aged well is how these fight scenes are filmed and choreographed and edited, and Paul Greengrass has a lot to do with that. You know, I think this movie is more than any movie. Maybe Ultimatum's worse. But this movie is famous for its shaky cam. 
And at the time, I remember thinking that it worked. I realize now that it doesn't. But at the time, I thought it was so kinetic, the fact that the cameras were handheld. And and it kind of just felt like the cameraman was fighting along with everybody. But I obviously realize it's not actually effective um, or visually interesting. But at the time, it hit hard for me, and it packed more of a punch. Um, and Paul Greengrass, I mean, he has the more influential style on this franchise so for better or for worse i feel like this franchise is more synonymous with him than i do doug lyman who directed the first movie so um i think the look and everything else that we have the style um it, it comes more so from green grass and he made it a little bit more iconic but i do think that again the board supremacy is one of the greatest action sequels ever made um and i think it it enhances everything that we got in the first one. It um, it also, I remember, I guess I should have said this about Ultimatum, but I love how it jumps to New York at the end of the film because it kind of feels like it could have been the end, but the Ultimatum is like this movie that's inserted between two scenes in Supremacy, and I remember that being like so surprising to me and so cool. I know that says more about Ultimatum, I guess, but uh, I love that idea, and it felt like a, I think this ending is more satisfying when we find out who his identity is and he has to sit down with the girl and, and confesses that he killed her parents and everything like that to me is, is uh, wonderful. So uh, the born supremacy, I think is the best born movie ever made. So there's that guys. Again, you can follow along with this list on my letterbox.com on my letterbox letterbox.com slash rewatch Ryan. There is born ranked. All right, let's do a non-spoiler discussion on Lightyear. You know, if you're listening to the Watch Diary podcast that this review appears on, I just got done talking about Bourne. And like Bourne, the Toy Story franchise is a highly influential one. I remember seeing the first one as a kid, and it's one of my favorite it's, it's not my favorite animated movie of all time, but it's probably my second favorite animated movie of all time. I grew up with that movie. And I related to it a lot because, um, well, first of all, I had toys from all of my favorite movies, just like Andy did. But I also had a lot of the Toy Story toys. I had Woody, I had Buzz, I had RC, I had Rex. I think I had some of the aliens, too. I had a lot of the toys from Toy Story. And it captured my imagination in, in the way that, like, seeing Andy play with the toys made me want to play with my toys or his toys like he did. Because um, up until that point, it was a lot of Batman, a lot of Spider-Man, and I was, you know... But the way that Andy plays with his toys, it kind of was just like, oh, I can play with toys like that and have more fun. And he was just an imaginative kid. <laughs> it's so weird to talk like this. But, um, it's, it, and also, I remember literally being pranked by my older sister and also pranking my younger sister um, on the idea that toys could actually come to life when we weren't looking. And I I, I remember seeing every Toy Story movie in theaters um, with the exception of Toy Story 4. I didn't see Toy Story 4 until about a couple of days ago, actually. Um, that one missed. But I, um, it's just a highly influential franchise on me, and I think it's one of the greatest movie franchises of all time. So, I don't remember exactly how I felt when Chris Evans announced. I remember, like, people being so confused and, like, making fun of Chris Evans' initial tweet where he was, like, explaining the angle. I never really was that confused. It, like, it's a really, it's an interesting idea. It really is. And it sort of creates this new category. Because, and, and I'm going to rank Toy Story movies here later, but it's not really a Toy Story movie. And it's also not really a spinoff. Like, it, it exists in an entirely different world. And uh, I just find that really interesting. And now, we got... I remember the Buzz Lightyear cartoon growing up. And I think I always took it as that's the cartoon that Andy watched. Um, or it's at least a cartoon inspired by that character. And uh, we got to see him battle Zerg. I don't remember a whole lot about the cartoon, but I do remember watching it growing up. So maybe it's not like the... It's an interesting idea for Hollywood. And it's an interesting idea for Pixar, I think. And it's not like this can really ever happen, because how many movies are about toys? Uh, but the thing that I, I... I just like the idea of like, oh, we're just going to do something completely different, because it just sounds like a creative pitch. And the movie opens, 
again, I'm not going to spoil the movie, but the movie opens with a title card that says, oh, this is the movie that Andy saw as a kid. And that's a, that's a neat idea. And I really appreciate it, actually. Um, so all of that aside, and Chris Evans voicing the characters Buzz Lightyear instead of Tim Allen, none of that stuff really bothers me. Um, I think ultimately my main reaction, though, when I left the movie is that, like, when you just get down to it and you, you know, set aside the conceptual and the pitch meeting and everything that can how this movie came to be, when you look at it, I think it just simply put, not really that strong of a Pixar movie. And I feel like you could say this, you know, obviously we live in an age, constant sequelization, you know, we're just kicking out franchise. I mean, we just did a Top Gun sequel. 40 years in the making. Like, this is really mostly what we're doing here when it comes to these big theatrical releases. This franchise. And at least this was like an interesting creative direction. But you can also argue that studios are constantly competing with themselves too. Because if they just keep cranking out the same kind of movie over and over again, um, it's so easy to point at it and be like, oh, this just isn't as good as the first time or the third time or the sixth time that they've done this thing. Star Wars. So... Unfortunately, that's kind of where we are with Toy Story, of all things. And I think we saw a little bit of this in Toy Story 4, where it's like, I don't know if Toy Story 4 is anybody's favorite Toy Story movie. And that's when a lot of people were like, oh, this is just like a Woody movie now. And, you know, it was the per- Toy Story 3 was the perfect ending. And now we, so even though it's a different take and a create a different angle here, I feel like a lot of that comes up now. Uh, with with Lightyear because we have four other movies that feature a different version of Buzz Lightyear. And even like two and a half of those movies don't really feature Buzz Lightyear anymore. So let's w- let's just talk about the first Toy Story. And the, f- the fact that Lightyear is born from a character that comes to life as a toy. Like, that is a, such a high concept. And, of course, Andy... It's, there's a reason Andy loves Buzz Lightyear. It makes sense. But... We're already watching a movie where the toy comes to life. And the, I think the point of Toy Story is that that's still going to be more fascinating. as whatever. And, of course, we got Woody's background, too. We know that Woody comes from a TV show. But we didn't get the Woody TV show. It was just a part of the plot of Toy Story 2. And it's not like I actually want to sit down and watch the show that the character of Woody was in. Because ultimately my Woody and the Woody I'm fascinated with is the one that has to deal with being a toy. And has to deal with being loyal to this kid. Like that's already so interesting and so high concept. So when we see the spaceman Buzz Lightyear, we get his origin story, if you will. He's competing with a completely different Buzz Lightyear that I just think is more interesting um of course it's more iconic it's more great toy story is one of the most important animated movies of all time and so by design it just kind of pales in comparison and what we end up getting is a beautiful looking but average science fiction animated film so while i respect the idea and the creative pitch here ultimately the execution of it it's just fine um take the toy story equation out of it and when you compare it to all the other pixar movies the the pitch actually isn't as creative as some of pixar's other films i mean when pixar came out with toy story and finding nemo and wally i mean all of those ideas were so creative and this one kind of goes the other way because this is the most generic maybe pixar has ever been um and it actually doesn't really I, I'm not really in love with any of the characters either. And I'm not really in love with this version of Buzz Lightyear. Uh, it, and it's so weird to talk this much and criticize. It feels weird criticizing an animated movie sometimes. It really does. But the, the Pixar as of late, I haven't been vibing with it in general. Because they've been cranking out like Soul and Pixar. Because I, it feels like they're they're trying to chop themselves creatively with more high concepts and all of these ideas that I don't really connect with. Cause they explain away things too much. And it kind of just like 
makes me question the existence of every concept in a movie. Like Soul, it's like, oh, here's the afterlife, but here's let's explain this, let's explain this, and this is a personification of this concept, and blah blah blah. And it's like, I don't really connect with any of that. Because then it's like every personification of a concept is kind of just like a character trying to be funny. And it doesn't really... There's, of course, manipulative and emotional moments to Inside Out and Soul. But at the same time, it just... It's like... It reminds me of how I feel about the MCU right now. Where it's just like... It's asking us to buy into these concepts that really just make us question and ask more questions about the MCU as a whole. And it just kind of ruins the enjoyment of everything that I've seen before. So, but again, Lightyear is like a completely different thing where it's like so generic that I, I find myself just kind of wondering what Pixar is doing right now. Um, there's definitely, there's fun action sequences. There's a couple of jokes in this movie that I thought were actually really funny, but I saw this with a mostly full crowd um, even though it was like 3 p.m. on a Thursday, it was a fairly early screening. The theater was mostly full, and a lot of the jokes didn't land with me, but they also didn't land with the crowd. Like, I didn't feel the crowd really in love with this movie. You know, I just think everybody thought it was a fine, fun movie, and um, I don't think it's going to be lasting in the legacy of Pixar and and ultimately unfortunately it just kind of makes me ask and i don't like doing the like did we need this thing because whether we need something or not it can still be a great story with great characters great filmmaking blah 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 and it's like i don't know if we ever really need anything but this is the kind of movie movie that makes me wonder did we did we need it um i re again i respect the creative idea i was thinking about jingle all the way of all things because that's a movie where, like, the toy is the toy, right? It's an object of obsession, but there's nothing beyond it. And Turbo Man, inside of Jingle All the Way, has his own show already, and he could already be, like, a pretty cool character. Not Booster. I don't need to see Booster. But, like, seeing, like, a Turbo Man animated movie, I feel like would work a lot more. Because there's a lot less to compete with. Because Turbo Man is already just such, like, a small thing in that movie. Uh, I feel like that'd be the better version, honestly. If like we went back like 15 years and somebody was like, hey, what if we actually gave this character Turbo Man a movie or a TV show? Um, but again, Buzz Lightyear, there's a version of him where he's a toy that comes to life. So I just feel like it's too much of a reach. Uh, and they're both... It's like, It's not like it's something that came from nothing. It's something that came from something. And it's just hard to compare and hard to reckon with, I think. So it's just, there's a lot of interesting science fiction concepts, but uh, we've seen them in other movies. So it's kind of underwhelming at that point. So if you put Buzz Lightyear in a science fiction movie, it's this ends up being a generic science fiction movie. Kids are going to like it, of course. It's a great family movie to watch. But um, again, I just don't think it has a level of greatness that I wish it had aspired to. And so I'm, I'm curious to see what the business is for this movie as time goes on and how it's remembered throughout the year. Uh, I'd be very, very surprised if they did a sequel. I'd be very, very surprised. Maybe a Disney Plus show um, in the spirit of what they did with the cartoon long ago. But I think, I think this is kind of it uh, right here. So I, I'm interested to see how this grows. But anyway... It was a fine animated movie. It was good to see an animated movie in theaters, not going to lie, because I haven't seen one in years. I usually don't go out and uh, seek them, but um, but anyway. Disney fans, it's harmless too. Like I said, it's not like it's bad by any means or atrocious. It's a harmless film. I just it makes me ask a lot of questions. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's my non-spoiler review for Lightyear, and I don't think it, there's really a, a spoiler discussion to be had here. It's fine. Um, I think that, and I'm going to review Spiderhead here lately. Uh, if you're like me and you're like my age, I think Spiderhead's the, the movie that you're going to be a little bit more into, uh, not that you're going to love it. I'll talk about it, but if you're like me and you're unsure about Lightyear, check out Spiderhead. I think there's more to discuss and more to think about with that. Uh, but anyway, that's Lightyear. Let's do in every movie ever. Let's rank Toy Story movies. Lightyear is not included in this list because Lightyear is not a Toy Story movie. It is not even really a spinoff of a Toy Story movie. It involves so much explanation that there isn't one word that I can use. Uh, so <laughs> Lightyear is not covered. Toy Story, four movies. It's one of the best franchises 
in existence. I hadn't really thought about how I ranked these movies up until a couple of days ago. I watched Toy Story 4 for the very first time the other day. And I think the only reason why I hadn't seen it in theaters, it's the only one I hadn't seen in theaters, is that as I've grown older, I just don't make it a point to go check out and go seek all of the animated movies that come out. It's a huge blind spot that continues to grow as I get older. But with that said, Toy Story is a highly influential franchise on my life. Toy Story is maybe the second, my second favorite animated movie of all time. Uh, I remember seeing it as a kid, and it was, you know, it's just one of those movies you fall in love with as a kid and watch over and over again. I had a lot of the toys that Andy had. Uh, I talked about that in my Lightyear review. But anyway, I looked it up on Letterboxd, uh, a lot of these Toy Story rank lists that people do, and it reminded me of how people rank the MCU. I mean, everybody's lists, for the most part, are wildly different just based on your taste maybe there's like one common denominator where it's like oh this is like easily the worst but the rest are so good that like depending on the list they're just like all over the place it could be three two one one three two two one three like there was a lot i have my list that i'm about to reveal here and i think my list was actually one of the ones that i saw the least like i definitely saw my list represented on letterboxd but um i was kind of shocked at one particular movie that i think is like so many people's favorites and i i'm kind of like i don't really get it it's a little weird um but anyway so it was fun though and again this is a list this is maybe one of the best lists that i've ever done on every movie ever because the quality is so high for every film that it kind of doesn't mean anything when you rank them because they're all just tied for first place you know they're just so good so we're just gonna have fun here it's not like it's the most controversial list of all time but yeah, let's just do it quickly. Uh, you can check out all my lists on letterbox.com slash rewatch Ryan. Just a reminder. Uh, it's only four movies, so I can breeze through this and I don't have to show you a graphic or anything. Uh, and that's me telling you. I don't have to show you a graphic. Uh, the number four, the worst quote unquote uh, Toy Story movie is the just simply the story that I connect with the least. And it is Toy Story 4. Um, I, I don't like the, do we need it argument for movies, but unfortunately I do think Toy Story 4 is kind of a cat, a, a movie that falls into that just because I thought Toy Story 3 wrapped up the universe so nicely, um, that I didn't really understand why we were doing a Toy Story 4. I welcomed it and I didn't think it was going to be bad by any means. I just kind of questioned what else is there to do. And Forky was at the front of the marketing and, you know, I was like, oh, okay, so this time there's just going to be a toy that's made out of a inanimate object, and it's going to come to life, and it's like, that idea, and that's not what Toy Story 4 is mainly about, it, it, I guess the plot of it is, but the concepts and the stories behind the other three films were more than just, oh, here's a new type of toy, it was still about identity and mortality and loyalty and a lot of these other themes that are still that still exist within Toy Story 4 but the way that we lift off uh with this concept and idea of Forky um it just wasn't as interesting to me um again a lot of the stuff in here the other thing I like about Toy Story is the ensemble and I just think this is like the least fun ensemble uh, the least fun I have with all of the characters and the humor changes a little bit too, because it kind of felt like the least, as of lately, again, I'm not the most well-read when it comes to Pixar, especially lately, but the inclusion of like the Keegan-Michael Key characters, like where, like a lot of the characters seem like they're comedians and they're all just trying to be funny. That wasn't really what the humor was. The humor was sort of born and bred from character work um, in the first three films and then it kind of just became what i think every other studio tries to be like it became like a secret life of pets where i just kind of feel like the the humor that's done is just characters yelling at each other and uh, that's kind of where it felt like it kind of felt like toy story 4 changed in tone a little bit too much and it was a little bit too much of a woody story i love woody um, but I, I just kind of feel like they tried something and it didn't really work for me and I didn't fall in love with it the way that I wanted to. But again, great scenes. Um, obviously I grew up with Andy, not Bonnie, but I do, I, I, I appreciate that they were trying to prolong the franchise, but also think they made choices that just 
I didn't connect with as much. Uh, it's also the longest, I think, of all the Toy Story movies, and I don't think that it's a franchise that lends itself to like overstaying its welcome either, because I think a lot of the same themes and the, some of the same ideas and concepts are overused at this point, like the idea of being a lost toy, and it's like we've kind of seen a version of that in every movie, um, so ho hopefully the story and the character work surrounding it is good, but I think this is the worst example. So Toy Story 4, um, I respect it. And it was kind of nice to watch another Toy Story movie for the, uh, you know, for the first time, but ultimately it doesn't work in the way that I think the other three do. So, uh, that is my number four. That is my least favorite Toy Story movie. Now I feel like this next one, this is the, like, According to Letterboxd and according to a lot how other people feel, this is the controversial choice here. And I was kind of shocked because I think it's like so... I, this was easy for me, but apparently not everyone agrees with this. The third best Toy Story movie is Toy Story 2. I... I like diving into... And maybe it's the better version of Lightyear where we kind of explore... Um, the the TV show or the movie where this character came from, we we come to know why this is such an important, valuable toy to Andy because it has so much history. And again, we deal with Woody's identity, but I just think the story in general, I actually find it to be pretty underwhelming as a sequel to Toy Story. And I can't believe that. Like, I think Toy Story Two is even higher ranked on Rotten Tomatoes, if I remember correctly. So I guess just simply put, again, these are all great films. But I'm just so confused as to why this seems to be, like, everyone's sure thing here. Yeah, okay, so they both have 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. I was mistaken. Toy Story and Toy Story 2 are both 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. But, like, I don't necessarily, like, fall in love with the new character. I like Jesse. I like Bullseye. But I don't fall in love with the new characters that they introduce, per se. So, I just kind of feel like it's a great movie and a great sequel, but I've would rather watch the first one any day again i appreciate the ensemble of the first movie more and so i just feel like it's obviously not as good but it seems to be a lot of people's favorite movie on letterboxd favorite of every toy story movie so that's just surprising to me that they spent more time away from andy and away from a lot of the main characters and they just kind of have this woody movie i mean like toy story 4 this is the woody movie and i do love woody as a character but it's a little more isolated and um it feels more like a spinoff than it does a sequel and so i just think it's not as good as toy story or toy story 3 so with that said i was literally literally shocked that i was that i saw so many toy story 2 in, in number one slots on, on Letterboxd. So I guess that's the controversial take. Apparently I'm in the minority. Toy Story 2 is one of the best Toy Story movies, according to most of you. So anyway, I was surprised to see that. Um, especially when I hear so much about Toy Story 3. So here's the thing. I saw Toy Story 2 in theaters, and I hadn't seen it since until a couple of days ago. So I've had the most time away from Toy Story 2. I, when I sat down, I kind of didn't really remember a whole lot of it. But the thing about Toy Story 3 and the reason why it's my number two is I feel like it res I could feel that it resonated with the culture more. Toy Story 2, it didn't resonate with me over the years since I'd seen it. I always Post Toy Story 2, I always just went back to the first film. Always. You know, Toy Story 3 didn't stay with me, and then Toy Story 3 came around. I didn't remember the conversation about Toy Story 2. It was just everybody was excited, and everybody loved Toy Story 3, like, unanimously. Um, the scene in the... It's not a trash compactor, but it's a furnace, right? That's one of the most iconic scenes in Toy Story history. It's the scene that made grown men cry. Toy Story 3 is when... As an adult, I wrestled with my mortality. Like right then and there, that's such an that's such an incredible moment for somebody who grew up with Toy Story and grew up with Andy in the early '90s with Pixar, and to to be forced to reckon with that idea that these toys could be lost and gone forever, even though of course that's not going to happen. But that is more emotionally damaging. Talk about emotional damage. That's emotionally damage damaging to somebody who grew up with these toys. And I just feel like it was such a, it's such a wonderful conclusion. We actually got to deal with 
Andy as a character and as a person and uh, leaving his toys for a new generation. And it's like, oh, we're going to leave this part of my life behind. There's so much that you reckon with as a person and as a fan with this movie. It's way more emotionally involving to me than Toy Story 2. Um, I, f- I feel like the f- Toy Story 1 and Toy Story 3 have just stayed with me and meant more to the culture. That's why I was so sh- surprised that Toy Story 2 is unsuspectingly a lot of people's favorite. But anyway, um, a lot of Toy Story 3, it kind of just goes without saying, I think it's an incredible sequel. And um, I love the new additions. I love the Barbie and Ken stuff. Lotso. All the ideas and everything. Everything, I think, worked in that movie. Um, again, contemplating handing this off to a new generation i just think i I value so much of what's in toy story 3 and i find it wildly entertaining and so i just think it's the best sequel but it still pales in comparison when we are talking about the original toy story you know the 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 kind of humor that i love in toy story it's like visual gags but it also is so organic like rex just makes me laugh for being rex uh, for have, being ridden with anxiety as a Tyrannosaurus Rex. like That kind of discovery with these characters is awesome. Um, I feel like even though the animation hasn't aged, there's more wonder when you watch Toy Story uh, for some reason. like the, It's not as good, but it also feels more new in the way that it's directed. And One of my favorite visual gags is when they're all watching the kids arriving at the birthday party. They're all up in Andy's room, and they're looking down the window at the driveway at all the kids arriving to Andy's birthday party. And there's that gag where they're like critiquing and judging all of the presents that are being carried in. And the one kid has a small box, and then they don't think anything of it, and then he turns, and it's just like this huge box, and the way all the toys react with, ah! It's literally, I think, the funniest joke in the entire franchise. I just get a kick out of it. And that organic humor, um, I just respond to more. And so, again, um, the Mrs. Nesbitt stuff when, Bo- uh, when Buzz is in drag at the tea party. And uh, I, there's so there's such a humor to, like, Sid as a character in general. Like, it's so ridiculous. Um, I don't know. I think all of that is just so funny to me. But, like... The dynamic between Woody and Buzz is at its best in this movie. This is the best Woody and Buzz movie. And I think that ultimately that's what Toy Story is. It's Woody and Buzz with a surrounding ensemble of characters. And they never are able to. And maybe they don't try to. And that's okay. But they are never able to capture, I think, the magic. All the character work that's done here uh, between the characters as they do. It's It's usually like either like... Uh, every movie is like Woody against the toys, but also I just feel like the relationships and everything are a little bit more complicated while also being funny. And again, there's just, there's some magic to seeing like Buzz trying to leap out the window and fall and break his arm. There's just like something more you reckon with so much more there. Um, and it's not as manipulative to me. That's like kind of when you decide, Oh, I'm in love with these toy characters is when you see things like that. And not just, you know, a scene where, you know, I just think it's more, I don't know, there's more magic to it, you know, and it's more unsuspecting. So I think Toy Story is hands down the best Toy Story movie. And I was surprised that a lot of people don't think that a lot of people think the third one, a lot of people think the second one. No, I don't think anybody really thinks the fourth one's the best, but Toy Story hands down is the best Toy Story movie. It goes Toy Story, Toy Story 3. Toy Story 2, and Toy Story 4. So there's that. Again, follow along with my list on letterbox.com slash rewatch Ryan. All right. Well, it's not often that I sit down and review Netflix movies because I don't typically like them, but this one is certainly notable because it's directed by Joseph Kaczynski, starring Miles Teller, and we're only three weeks removed from the release of Top Gun Maverick, a movie that I obviously love because of my goose or rooster mustache. But I'll tell you what, three movies in to this Kaczynski, Miles Teller thing, this is one of the most exciting, one of the more exciting recent director-actor combinations um, that I've seen. You know, I thought it was going to be Miles Teller and Damien Chazelle, you know, all those years ago, but uh, here we are. I think they've they found their muse in each other, 
And speaking of Miles Teller, you know, Miles Teller, I haven't seen the offer, but that's going on right now where it just ended on Paramount Plus. And this is one of the most, this is the most prolific that Miles Teller has been since probably 2014. I mean, the heat around him right now, it reminds me of why I became such a big fan of his in the first place. Because Spectacular Now and Whiplash are two of the greatest movies of my lifetime. And he's a huge reason for that. So the fact that he's getting all this heat again, it, it makes me happy. As someone who is a self-proclaimed uh, Miles Teller fanatic, uh, he's crushing it right now. And I haven't seen the offer, but I do want to watch it now. Um, but look, this was uh, certainly a movie that I was interested in seeing because of just all the heat around everybody. You know, we're also about to get Thor 4, Chris Hemsworth doing an unusual role for him. It was just, uh, it was exciting to check it out. And it, it felt like, for some reason, I, f I sat down and started this and I felt like I wouldn't, it would end and I wouldn't feel like I usually do with Netflix movies, which instantly forgettable most of the time, Netflix movies. I, I don't really have any particular fandom for any Netflix movie in existence. And even the ones directed by the greatest directors of all time, like the Irishman, just don't really care for it. Um, but this one I was interested in and I'm, I'm glad I watched it. And I'm happy to review it here today, even though it's, it's got its issues. It's not amazing. It does sort of live under this Top Gun Maverick shadow, but it's also a wildly different movie. So it's unfair to compare the two. But I mean, if we want to start with these nice little anecdotes, neat little anecdotes, it doesn't compare to, I think, the other two outings that Kaczynski and Miles Teller have had together. But again, it's a wildly different movie. When I did my first ranking of Joseph Kaczynski movies, I, of course, just divided them between his sci-fi epics and these Americana, you know, these real American hero Americana stories. And this is this doesn't fall into either one of those categories, really. Um, this movie, I think, is like Joseph Kaczynski's Ex Machina, if you will. There's a very similar premise. It comes from a short story. It's a tonally like muted science fiction film um but it's not as you know futuristic and driven by technology the way that it, uh, oblivion or tron is it's driven more by um psychology and pharmaceuticals and it it definitely is interesting to watch and it is held down by the acting i think the acting and the writing but mostly the acting is what carries this film through and Miles Teller gives an excellent performance. Journey Smollett does a great job as well. She doesn't have she doesn't have as big of a, a role as I wish or thought that she was gonna have, but she does a great job playing Miles Teller's love interest in the movie. But I think the the big deal here is Chris Hemsworth because it's just not often that we see Hemsworth exceed in characters outside of Thor. You know, we saw it with Extraction. I, Extraction was at the time, I think, one of the Netflix's biggest movies. But Hemsworth on Netflix works quite a bit. I mean, I think it's just because he's just such an interesting, high-profile star um, that it, it makes his movies instantly watchable when they're on Netflix. But uh, so far, it's working. He's two for two. Uh, I think that this is in an upper echelon, an upper category in terms of movies that Netflix probably doesn't deserve. But it's also... Um, it's a movie that I wish was on Netflix all of the time because they make such it's 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 hard. It's like in this weird purgatory where it's like better than Netflix, but it doesn't quite live up to what a lot of these other actors have done and what this director has done. So there's definitely stuff looming over it as well, while also being an extremely interesting Netflix watch. Like the other Netflix movie I watched this year was the one I don't even remember the name starring Jesse Plemons and Jason Siegel. I don't even remember the name of that movie. It was one of the first movies I think I reviewed on this podcast or on this YouTube channel. Don't even remember it, but I'm going to remember Spiderhead and I can tell you a whole lot more about it than I can that movie. Um, this also obviously came out the same weekend as Lightyear. And while I don't think it's as good as Lightyear, I definitely think it's a movie like worth checking out more because it's like, there's more discussion, I think, to be had around Lightyear, who just just came out harmlessly, like, super generic. Um, but this one is interesting throughout, and um, your mileage may vary, though. So, again, I think it all comes down to the acting. Chris Hemsworth is playing somebody I've never seen him play before. He's the lead of 
he's the lead of the movie, I think. Well, he's not the lead of the movie. He's the second lead, but he heads this pharmaceutical program that um, basically takes in prisoners who volunteer for this program in, in exchange for a reduced sentence. And what he's trying to do, he's basically just testing pharmaceuticals and testing drugs um, on these inmates while also kind of overall seeing this psychological experiment. And I love stuff like that. And I think it causes, I think a lot of what makes Teller and Journey Smollett shine is the psychological trauma that they already have to deal with while also being under psychological trauma uh, due to what Hemsworth is doing to them. So it's a fascinating idea. It kind of borders on the edge of like a what's real, what's not kind of movie a little bit. It doesn't quite succeed if that's what you're looking for. But I think this is simply put just an interesting, nice little uh, thriller where it's well acted and you want to see what's next, but it doesn't quite live up to what it could be and what it should be. So maybe I unfairly compared it to Ex Machina because I think Ex Machina ask the questions you want to be asked. It, it, it's a will they, won't they, what would I do in this situation? Philosoph ask more questions philosophically than uh, this movie does. And I just think Ex Machina gets a whole lot more out of its material than this movie does. But overall, I just do think, I think it's a nice little movie. That's it. I know that sounds like condescending, but I, I don't think it's the greatest thing, but I also was glad I watched it. And I think it's definitely notable um especially right now because of where we are and i wanted to see kaczynski do something different you know because he he surprised me first when he went from oblivion to only the brave i mean what a what a shift for me personally in terms of quality but also tone and genre and i welcomed it and top gun maverick was one of my favorite movies of the year so I didn't want to, I didn't need another Top Gun Maverick. I wanted another shift and I got another shift. And um, I, I think he's a promising filmmaker and I think he can deliver the goods. He's not perfect. Um, I don't know if I'm a Joseph Kaczynski fan per se, but I will anticipate everything that he comes out with looking for the next shift because he is a surprising filmmaker um, because he's learning and he's evolving and he's growing and improving. So I, um, for those reasons, Spiderhead was definitely worth watching and checking out, and you're gonna get a gr you're gonna get great performances, no matter what. So definitely check it out. There's some there's some great scenes in the movie too that surprised me. There's a scene particularly at the, at the end that left me on the edge of my seat. It kind of shifts wildly in tone. It kind of becomes something else in the third act. Um, so again, your mileage may vary on that. But uh, and maybe it's a little long. I think the movie's a little too long for what it ends up exploring. Uh, but overall I did appreciate the movie and it's really, really solid. And uh, so definitely check it out. It's one of the better movies I've seen on Netflix um, this year. Another movie that I talked about on the podcast once, it was the movie that Antoine Fuqua and Jake Gyllenhaal did. I can't even remember the name of it. Um, and I, at the time I felt like maybe that was an example of everything that I said Spiderhead is, but I've instantly forgot about that movie too. And um, I just don't think Spiderhead's going to be that. Um, it's just, um, I really appreciated it. I, I recommend it, though, again, I can't promise you anything amazing. So there's that. And um, that's all I got. That's my non-spoiler review. All right. Part two. This is the second time we've done a Joseph Kaczynski ranked list on every movie ever. Spiderhead came out on Netflix. Check it out. I just reviewed it on the channel, and you probably just heard it on the podcast. But with that said, let's update our Joseph Kaczynski movies ranked list, shall we? I only have to insert one movie, so it's going to be a quick, breezy video. I think still my least favorite Joseph Kaczynski movie is Tron Legacy. I think it's the one that has the least amount of character work in it. Um, I was amazed by the visuals, but I think the tone is a little too dry. There's not enough, enough meat on the bone to get me excited about the story and the character work. And I think it thinks it's emotional, but it's not. And um, I don't know. I just think it's a little too dry, a little too stale at times. So I appreciate a lot of the aspects upon rewatch, but Tron Legacy is still my least favorite movie. 
Now, this is where it gets hard because this is where this is about the range where I find myself. I just saw Spiderhead. I just finished it. So it's brand new in my brain. Ultimately, it has the most in common with Oblivion because it's a muted science fiction film. One's more about psychology. One's a lot more isolated in scale and scope. But the action, and I'm sorry, the acting and the performances, I think, shine in Spiderhead more. So I think I'm going to keep Oblivion as number four. Now, Oblivion is probably more my type of movie. It's Tom Cruise. There's action. But again, and the sound design, that's what I was blown away by. The visual look of Oblivion is wonderful. I think te- not, excuse me, technologically, Oblivion is superior but i think again it's the story and the character work that's done i don't think it's as strong as spiderhead so i might regret this later and i might change it up and maybe i have another opportunity the next time joseph kaczynski comes out with a movie i have another opportunity to do this ranking but right now I'm so intrigued by the topic of Spiderhead that I think I'm going to leave Oblivion at number four and Spiderhead at number three. But I also think, again, if there are any two movies who share the... They're like the brother movies. Um, well, but also while being wildly different. So right now, I'm so taken by the Miles Teller performance. I'm so taken by the Hemsworth. And I love the idea, again, because I've decided that Miles Teller and Joseph Kaczynski, what an interesting actor-director pairing that we have right now, that I just feel like it makes sense to me that every time Kaczynski and Teller paired up, they end up being Kaczynski's best movies. Like, that makes sense to me. Um, It's more that than it is Kaczynski and Tom Cruise. So... Oblivion's my number four, and Spiderhead is my number three. You can check out my review of Spiderhead on the channel right now. I think it's like in this weird purgatory where it's like better than being a Netflix movie while also not quite living up to what it could have been if it was like a theatrical release. You know, I think Kaczynski was tr- maybe he wasn't trying to, but this could have been his ex machina, and it doesn't quite live up to that. It is driven entirely by great performances, but ultimately I don't think it does as much as it possibly could with its premise. There are some really great acting, great writing, great scenes, and I was constantly wondering what was waiting for me around the corner. Um, The third act, um, it kind of changes tone and it makes this weird left turn um, that I wasn't quite satisfied with, but I think a lot of the journey of it, it it was worthwhile and I appreciated it uh, for what it was. And, uh, yeah, I think I was mostly taken by Hemsworth, though Miles Teller was also awesome. And we're, right now, there's just so much heat around Miles Teller that it feels right giving him the top three. And this is more of a Miles Teller movie, or Miles Teller ranking, isn't it? Um, it just feels right to me. So right now, Spiderhead is my number three. My number two and my number one haven't changed. I think that Only the Brave is, it, it might actually be Kaczynski's best film. Um, emotionally 100% it's his best film but um, I think Top Gun Maverick is just there's just way too much hype and way too much heat and I've seen it three times in theaters already and I want to see it a fourth time before it leaves Top Gun Maverick it just I think has more it's has a greatness that uh, only the brave doesn't quite have Um, but there are still incredible films only the brave it's the least seen, probably, of all of his movies, um, because I kind of just remember it coming and going in theaters, whereas I remember like Tron Legacy and Oblivion being like appointed viewing. Only the Brave, I beg of you, please watch it. It's incredible. But Top Gun Maverick, you can't deny its greatness. So that is my updated list for Joseph Kaczynski ranked. And we'll see how it ages. You know, there's other opportunities. I'm going to do a quarterly report where I rank every movie I've watched in this quarter. So who knows? Maybe Spiderhead uh, will dip down uh, between now and then. But yeah, as of right now, that's how I feel. Anyway, there's that ranking of Joseph Kaczynski. Well, I think we had some fun here. You know, we talked about Toy Story. We talked about Bourne. We talked about Kaczynski. I like going on this week. I uh, like I said I earlier I recorded a rewatch of Minority Report for its 20th anniversary. I just did the Jason, oh, I'm sorry, the Born Identity rewatch for its 20th anniversary. We have a, a couple of other 
notable anniversaries that I will read off to you real quick. Um, oh, we're also going to be talking Elvis. So I, I can't remember if they changed the release date for the Black Phone. I think they did. I think originally at one point I saw Black Phone and Elvis coming out at the same time. But Elvis is definitely the movie that we're going to be discussing next week on Watch Diary. Uh, so get ready for that. Um, but yeah, we have the Minority Report rewatch coming out on the 21st. And then Blade Runner. 40th anniversary for Blade Runner. Blade Runner is a movie that I famously don't really care for that much. Um, I'm going to rewatch it. Uh, I'm not really that excited about it, but I am going to rewatch it. I'm going to rewatch the theatrical cut because this is the 40th anniversary. That's the only cut to watch. 40th and in this context, I don't want to get into that argument. Uh, it's 40 years from the theatrical release of Blade Runner, so that's the cut I'll be rewatching and posting about. Also, John Carpenter's The Thing, which is one of my favorite horror movies of all time. 40th anniversary, so I'll be talking about both of those movies. In some aspect. We also have a 25th anniversary for Face Off. Which means it's about time I, I get to my Nicolas Cage ranked part 2. And I listed a couple of other movies. I, I want to watch Moonstruck. I think the plan was. My Nicolas, Pe excuse me, my Nicolas Cage ranked part 2 video. Was going to be every movie that was referenced. In Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. That I of course hadn't already seen. So that was Moonstruck. Guarding Tess. Gone in 60 Seconds, and National Treasure. And then we'll add Face Off to that. So it's actually going to be five movies that I rank. And I need to get on that. And that will come out very soon. And then there's um, the 29th will be... A, it's a Magic Mike 10, 10th anniversary. I might do a rewatch of that. And then we'll finish up with an episode on the Black Phone. And that'll do it for the rest of June. Um, once June is finished, I will be getting ready again for my quarterly report. It's one of the very first videos I made when I made this YouTube channel. I did the quarterly report for the first quarter of 2022, and I ranked every single movie that I watched from January to March. So I'm going to watch, or I'm sorry, I'm going to rank every movie that I've watched from April to June of this year. And I might even like do, <laughs> I might regret it, but I might rank every movie that I watched this year up until this point. And we'll do like a mid-year sort of retrospective. And maybe I'll do like my top 10 list so far this year. Like there's going to be a lot that happens for the rest of June. Um, and uh, yeah, and we'll get, I'll probably do all of that after Thor Love and Thunder. I'll get Thor Love and Thunder out of the way that first week of July. And then, um, and then we'll do all that stuff. So we have a, an exciting couple of weeks coming up here. And uh, I love you guys as per usual. Hope you enjoyed this episode and all the videos. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok at Rewatch Ryan. You can find me on letterbox.com slash Rewatch Ryan. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week. We'll talk Minority Report and Elvis. Peace.